Uh, and Vivek, we are seeing some of the usual suspects, the miners like uh, Rio Tinto, BHP, as well as the steelmakers seeing a bit of a lift. How much of this has already been priced in and how much, I guess, follow through benefit do you really see for Asia? So it's, it's, it's an interesting question because when you look at a, a bill uh, such as, say, $550 billion in additional spending, how much of that is actually linked to the mining output? And from what we see in terms of looking at um, the, the component of U.S. fixed uh, investment, which goes into that space, it's only about 4 to 5 percent. Most of that money will go into um, the, the, the labor component. So this is uh, still quite a small component. But it's not just the size that's, that's of concern. It's also the duration. How long will this take to be deployed? Um, you know, historically, we've seen analysis where it takes about five years to plan a project. Um, and five years to actually deliver. And so, you know, we're talking um, incrementally uh, a very small spend on mining um, output. Um, and that's something that for us is, is um, means that this, this demand impulse we talk about from an infrastructure bill like this isn't going to be a, a game changer. In fact, what we're more optimistic about is, is the $3.5 trillion um, economic package which sits beside this in terms of what the the, um, the Democrat Party is really looking to do um, come uh, September time when they try and put two bills forward. Um, that $3.5 trillion package, which involves more of the climate change policies and what that means for certain metals, that certainly can, can change the, the dynamic when we talk about um, you know, transition metals like copper, nickel, uh, lithium. Uh, those are the, the commodities which are mm. at risk of shortage when we really talk about that $3.5 trillion package. But for iron ore, it, it seems like the catalyst still continues to be China, right? Particularly with these worries about an environmental crackdown going into the Winter Olympics. Is there further downside for iron ore? Yeah, look, we've seen iron ore prices really capitulate over the last uh, three weeks. And and really what's, what's driving that, as you said, is these steel output cuts. And... And it's, it's something which, if um, we see the implied cuts take place in the second half, um, to get uh, total steel production in China in 2021 at 2020 levels, uh, it, it means uh, a dramatic fall in, in China's iron ore demand. And, and that's something that for us is, is quite concerning, because we saw a 12 percent lift in China's steel output in the beginning of this year, um, in the first six months of this year. We need to see an equivalent 12 percent reduction in the second half. Um, and that's something that that um, can be very uh, concerning when it comes to that that iron ore demand story. Our, our view on that is: look, for now, this policy has has a lot of traction, but our concern is that the the implied contraction level is going to result in a shortage of steel, um, and that may result in higher steel prices. And and for us, um, like we saw in mid-May, policymakers may start focusing on on inflation concerns and. That may see this policy relaxed a little bit. And that's something we expect to play out as the year progresses. But for now, if you're looking at the 12% reduction in the second half, um, that certainly implies mm. um, downside risk to iron ore from even where we are today. More downside for gold, especially given what's happening with the dollar and real yields? Uh, absolutely. So, look, our, our forecast for gold. Um, is that we'll trend down to about $1,700 an ounce uh, by the first quarter of next year. Um, now, that forecast is really underpinned by hawkish Fed policy, and, and that will help guide um, this idea of a stronger U.S. dollar and, and higher U.S. 10-year real yields. Um, and both factors are, are really playing a role here in terms of weighing on, on, on the precious metal. In terms of the, the, the key events and, and how we're seeing the market, Look, our house call is that uh, in September we'll hear the FOMC announce tapering, um, and that'll take place sometime in, in Q4. And, and that for us will be really the trigger point as well for, for that bullish argument for, for gold to really um, come under pressure, because um, we see that that downside is persisting so long as that, that hawkish stance remains in the U.S. And you're putting uh, Brent, uh, the price target, at $85 a barrel. What's going to take us there? No, oh, it's, 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 it's a good question. Look, that forecast was made before we saw this latest outbreak of, of COVID-19 mm. uh, in China. 
Um, but really, if we're going to get to 85, I think we're going to need to see two things. One is a quick um, recovery out of the current outbreaks in China and, and the rest of Asia, but particularly China, given they account for about 15 percent of global oil demand. Um, but it's, it's, it's also going to need to see OPEC Plus uh, be quite concerned and, and potentially even uh, reduce the supply increases this year. So, you know, those are the two moving parts that we envisage to get us to 85, but we certainly see downside risks because um, what's happened with COVID-19 and its spread particularly to China has, has certainly changed that supply-demand equation.